Howdy. All right, we're going to take a look at the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line. Um, the slope-intercept form is a very handy form for writing the equation of a line, and the equation of a line represents all the different points on the line that satisfy that equation. Um, so we're going to start off with a, a situational example here. And in this situational example, Paula works for X hours at $4 per hour, and then she works for Y number of hours at time and a half. She earns a total of $48 in the day, and we want to write an equation that relates the X and the Y, and then we're going to graph that equation. Well, to begin with, we need to understand that when she works, um, when she earns $4 an hour, and she works for X number of hours, how would we represent all the money she earns off of that X number of hours? Well, if it's $4 for each and every one of those hours, then it would be four times the number of hours, and the number of hours is going to be X. So this 4x represents all the money she earns off of just that straight time pay. But then she has a situation where if she works overtime, she gets time and a half for that overtime. Well, how does time and a half work? What happens there is you take your straight pay and you add to it half of that straight pay. So there's a couple ways of handling. One is to say, well, I'm going to take my straight pay of $4.00. And I'm just going to simply multiply that by one and a half. And when I multiply by one and a half, that's going to come out to $6 an hour. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to say, well, I'm going to start with my time of $4, and I'm going to do add to it half of that, and half of that 4 is going to be 2. And again, 4 plus 2 will give me 6. Either way, her time and a half pay is going to be $6 an hour. Well, she does that for Y number of hours. So how would we represent all the money that she earns off of this overtime that she works? Just like we said, it's going to be $4 an hour times the number of hours. It's going to be $6 an hour times the number of hours. So 6y will show all the money that she earns off of that. So we have a pile of money here. This 4x is going to be the straight time that she works. This pile of money, the 6y, shows the overtime pay. So here's the two amounts of money. What are we going to do with these two amounts of money? Well, sure, she's going to put them together. And how do we show that we're putting them together? We show that operation by addition. So we're going to add the two up, and when we add them up, what should we get? In that day, she earned a total of $48. So here's the equation that represents that situation, and we need to graph that equation. Well, at this point, one of the best ways to graph that equation is to simply use our x and y intercepts, because that's all we know right now. Now, if you recall, to get an x-intercept, I'll put this over here. An x-intercept, remember, is where the graph crosses this x-axis right here. Everything on this x-axis, there is no up or down movement at all for every one of the points on here. Since there's no up or down movement, that means the y-coordinate is going to be zero. So to get an x-intercept, you simply make that y zero. So I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to take that y right there, and I'm going to turn it into a zero. So then 6 times 0 is just 0, so really I just have 4x equal to 48, which means I go through and I divide by 4. That tells me that the x is going to be a 12. Now remember, that is a point in the 2D coordinate plane, so I need to represent it with coordinates, and the coordinates are going to be that when the, when the y is 0, the x became a 12, and that's going to be one of my points on that line. Now I just simply need to get the y-intercept, and to get the y-intercept, if you recall, y-intercept is where it crosses this y-axis right through here. Every single point on this axis through here, the y-values are changing. They could be positive, they could be negative, but one thing I know for sure is every single point on this axis has no left or right movement at all. So the x-coordinate for every one of these points is going to be zero. So I'm going to make my x zero in order to get the y-intercept. So that means I'm taking this equation, I'm tossing a zero right here where this x is. So now I have 4 times 0 plus 6y equals 48. And yet again, 4 times 0 is just 0, which means I really just have 6y equal to 48. So at this point, when I divide through by 6, that tells me the y is 8. And yet again, this is a point in the 2D coordinate plane, so I'm going to represent it with ordered pairs. The relationship is when the x was 0, the y became an 8. There's the second point on that line. How many points does it take to make a line? Two. I've got two right there. 12, 0, and 0, 8. Now, notice that in this 2D coordinate plane, this x here represented hours. This y here 
represented also ours. Now let's think about this. Does it make sense back here, these are all negative numbers, does it make sense to have negative hours? No, not at all. And on this one down here is all negative numbers, does it make sense again to have negative hours? No, not at all. So I don't need this part of the 2D coordinate plane and I don't need that part of the 2D coordinate plane. I only need the first quadrant. So what I'm going to do is just move this down here just a little bit so we can see it better. And my point 12, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's 12, 0. And 0, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 0, 8 sits here. I can connect the two with a straight line. Oops. Let's try to make it better than that. And remember, what this line does is it shows us every combination of straight time hours and time and a half hours. Every combination on here would allow us to, or allow Paula to make $48. Every single point on that line will satisfy this equation that's right here. Now, what if we would take this equation, what if we would rearrange it a little bit? Like, let's say we wanted to get this Y right here all by itself. Now, if I wanted to get that y completely by itself, what would it take? Now, remember, if I knew what y was, like say, for instance, I knew it was a 10, according to straight order of operations, I would put that 10 in there. According to order of operations, I would multiply it by 6, and then I would add whatever this is. I'm going to reverse order of operations in order to get that y by itself. The last thing that I said is the first thing that I fixed. So the last thing that I said was add this 4x, so that means I'm going to subtract it off to get it out of the way. I'm going to do the opposite and subtract it off. That will leave me with a 6y equal to a negative 4x, remember the name tag in the front, and this is a positive. But that y isn't quite by itself yet. I need to go through and divide by 6. So I'm going to divide this side by 6, leaving me with that y by itself. I'm going to divide this side by 6. Now remember when I divide this side by 6, that means I'm dividing every single term by 6, this term and that term by 6. So I get a negative 4,6x. And a 48 divided by 6 is simply going to be an 8. Always simplify your fractions if you can. Negative 4, 6 becomes a negative 2 thirds. And so now the y is by itself. But notice with this equation, compare this number back here with what's happening in this graph. Do you notice a comparison here with that number 8 and with this graph? Absolutely. That 8 is this y-intercept that you see right here. So in other words, this is going to be the y-intercept for that particular equation, for that particular line. Also notice this negative 2 thirds. We've talked about slope, and we said slope was rise over run. Rise over run is a counting tool, and what it does is it allows us to get from one point on the graph to every other point on the graph. Now, if I look at this negative 2 thirds, and we've talked before about how that negative can sit on the top, it can sit on the bottom, it can sit out front. Just don't put it in both places, because if you put it on the top and the bottom, then you have a positive fraction. This is clearly a negative fraction. But what if I would take that negative and throw it up here on the top? That tells me my rise is negative, so from here I'll come down to 1, 2. My run is positive, that means I'll go to the right, so I'll come down 1, 2, and I'll go to the right. 1, 2, 3, land me right there. Then I'll go down another two, one, two, and I'll go to the right, one, two, three, land me right there. And I'll come down two, and I'll go to the right, three, land me right there, and then I'll come down two, right, three, land me right there. So that generates all the other points on the line. Notice, too, that if I would take that negative and I put it down here instead, that means I'm going to go up two, left three, but if I go up two, I'll go one, two, left, well, from here, I'll go up two, left three, bam, up two, left three, bam up two, left three, bam, up two, left three, bam. So that still generates every single point on the line. So what I'm trying to illustrate for you is that this form right here is another form for the equation of the line. This is what we call our slope-intercept form of the equation of the line. So slope-intercept is a very handy form for the equation of the line.
And slope intercept looks like this, y equals mx plus b. Oftentimes when I ask people for the formula for slope, they will tell me y equals mx plus b. But y equals mx plus b is not the formula for slope. Formula for slope is subtract the y's on the numerator, subtract the x's on the denominator. That's the formula for slope. What we have here is the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line. But when you're here, that number m is going to be your slope, the number right in front of the x, and this b right here will be your y-intercept. The key thing that you need to know about this form is you are in that form when that y is by itself. That is critically important. If the y is by, not by itself, then you cannot say that the number in front of the x is the slope. You cannot say that that number sitting by itself is the y-intercept. Notice in the original equation that we had here, we had 4x plus 6y equals 48. If we looked at that, we would say that the slope is 4. And that would mean from here, we're going to go up 4, right 1, up 4, right 1. That's going to create a line that's going this way, which is clearly not right. Clearly, the slope on this one was a negative 2 thirds. So, we need to make sure that whenever we're trying to identify slope, that the y is completely by itself. So the key features, again, of your slope-intercept form are that you have a slope. It's always going to be the m, always going to be the number that's in front of the x. And it's very handy because that gives you your rise over run. And it allows you, like you see right here, to count from one point on the graph to another point on the graph, generating the entire graph. You can also identify your y-intercept. And that y-intercept, remember, is going to be where that line crosses the y-axis. Now, this is very helpful because your slope-intercept form can be used to graph the equation of the line. But you have to be very careful because what a lot of people do, like for instance in the example that we just had where my equation was y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 8. What a lot of people will do is they'll start with the slope and they'll say, well, let's start here at 0, 0 and then they'll come down to right 3 and land it here and then they'll put their y-intercept of 8 on there and they'll connect the two like this. But you can clearly see that this line is not the same as this line. So yes, slope is a great counting tool. Rise over run is so helpful. However, you have to have a place to count from. You cannot just start at the origin. So you graph your line by plotting the y-intercept first. That has to go first. Then use your slope which is your rise over run as your counting tool to be able to get all the other points that are on the line. So let's practice this a little bit and see how this works. And in each of our examples, we are going to find the slope and the y-intercept And then we're going to use that information to graph the line. So let's take our first example. And in the first example, we have y equals one third x plus two. Now remember, in order to find the slope and the y-intercept, we have to have this in slope-intercept form. And remember, slope-intercept form looks like this. It looks like y equals mx plus b. And the key thing is right here, the y is by itself. When the y is by itself, we are the most definitely in that slope-intercept form. In this case, the y is by itself, we're good to go. So when it's by itself, the slope is going to be the number right in front of the x, so it's going to be one-third, and the y-intercept is going to be the number that's by itself. However, folks, please understand that this is a point in the 2D coordinate plane. Since it's a point in the 2D coordinate plane, even though some programs, like for instance my math lab, won't make you write it in ordered pair form, 
it is insanely important that you put that in ordered pair form because it's a point in the 2D coordinate plane. Also because it's very important that you know where the zero goes. This being a y-intercept, here's my y-axis and every single point on this y-axis has an x-coordinate of zero because there's no left or right movement at all. So that means my y-intercept is going to be zero too. So be sure that you write it in ordered pair form. Now then, I've got all the information that I need to be able to graph it. So like we said, yeah, this is a great counting tool, rise over run, but I have to have a place to count from. So I'll start with this y-intercept of 2. From there, here's my rise of 1. That means rise is up and down movement. That rise, you rise vertically up and down. So that's going to be your vertical movement. And you run on a horizontal. You people who run hills, you're crazy. Run on a horizontal straight across. So my rise is 1. So from here, I'm going to go up 1. And then I'm going to go to the right 3. So I'll go up 1, right 3, lands me here. There's the two points that it takes to make that line. And it only takes two points. So there's the graph of that line. All right, let's try another one. Let's try y equals negative 5 halves x plus 14. Once again, it's very easy to pull out that slope and that y-intercept when it's in slope-intercept form and that y is by itself. The y is by itself here, so I'm good to go. The slope is going to be the number that's right in front of that x. And the y-intercept is going to be this number right here. Again, it's a point in the 2D coordinate plane, so put it in coordinate form. It's a y-intercept. Everything on this y-axis has an x-coordinate of 0 because there is no left or right movement at all on that axis. But my y-intercept here is going to be 0, 14. So again, rise over run, rise over run, beautiful thing, but I've got to have a place to count. I've got to have a place to count from. So I'm going to start here with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Whew. And then from there, I'm going to use my negative 5 halves. Remember that negative can sit on the numerator or on the denominator, just not both. Most people toss it up here on the numerator, so I'll go with that. That means from here, I'm going to come, that's the rise. That's negative meaning go down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then my run is positive, so that's going to go to the right. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and over 2 lands me right there. Oops, that's a terrible job. Let me try that again. There we go. So there's the two points that it takes to make that line. All right, so what if the equation starts looking like this? Now remember, I can pull out the slope and I can pull out the y-intercept when the y is by itself, but you can see clearly the y is not by itself here. But I can do some rearranging, manipulating that equation to get that y by itself. All I have to do is remove that x. So remember to remove it, since I'm working across that equal sign, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to subtract it off. That gives me y equals name tag. This is a negative x. That is a positive 5. The sign in front is a sign that goes. But now the y is by itself, so sure the number right in front of that x is going to be my slope. My slope here is going to be a negative 1. And my y-intercept is going to be that 5, putting it as an ordered pair form because it's a point of 2D coordinate plane that's going to be 0, 5. Again, cannot stress to you enough, even though my math lab won't make you write it in ordered pair form, you will have to write it in ordered pair form on this test. So be sure that you get into the practice of writing it in ordered pair form. So now I've got what I need to be able to graph it, and so I'm going to remember, great counting to all the slope, however, I've got to have a place to count from, so we'll start with my y-intercept of 5 right here. From there, negative 1 being my slope. Now remember, it's got to be a rise over a run, which means I need a fraction, but anytime you have an integer, very easy to turn it into a fraction, just put it over top of a 1. So now my rise is a negative 1, that means from here I'm going to come down 1, my run is a positive one, so I'm going to come down one, right one, lands me right there. There's the two points that it takes to make that line. Voila, good to go. So now that we're really good at that, let's try a little bit of more of a complicated um, equation, one that's a little bit more challenging to rearrange. So let's take a peek at this one.
So again, my directions say that what I want to do here is I want to pull out the slope and the y-intercept to be able to graph it. That means I have to get that y by itself. So what I'm going to do here to get the y by itself is um, I'm going to reverse my order of operations. If I knew what y was and I plugged it in there, like if I knew the y was a 10 and I put it in here, according to straight order of operations, I would multiply by 3 and then I would add this 4x. The last thing that I said was add a 4x. That's the first thing I'm going to undo, and I'm going to remove that 4x by subtracting it off. So that gives me 3y equal to a negative 4x plus 9. Sign in front's a sign that goes. That's a negative. That's a positive. But the y is not completely by itself yet. So I'm going to go through and divide by 3. That gives me a y here. When I divide this side by 3, I'm dividing every single term by 3. I'm dividing this term by 3. And I'm dividing this term by 3. Now, 9 divided by 3 is just a 3. But now that y is completely by itself. So now it's very easy for me to identify my slope and my y-intercept. When the y is by itself, the number right in front of the x is going to be the slope. And the y-intercept is going to be this number that's all by itself. And remember, point the 2D coordinate plane. So that means that because it's crossing this y-axis right here, Every single point on this axis has an x-coordinate of 0 because there's no left or right movement at all for every one of these points. And so my y-intercept is going to be 0, 3. And like we've said before, I have to have a place to count from with this slope. So I'm going to start with this y-intercept of 0, 3. From there, I can start, I can put the negative up on the numerator. That would mean come down 4. And then my um, run would be a positive 3. That would land me right here. And there's the two points that it takes to connect that line. Notice that if I would have chosen, instead of put that negative down here on the denominator, that means my rise is positive. So from here I'd go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and I would go to the left 3. But notice I go up 4, left 3, that would land me right here. And if I extend this, sure enough, that's still on the line. So it really doesn't matter whether you put the negative on the numerator or on the denominator. Just pick one spot. Now, one more example of this, because this one has a very interesting twist to it. And the interesting twist is that with this, when there is a zero on the other side of the equal sign, some very strange things can happen. Now, in this, this is the same direction. I want to get the slope and the y-intercept, so I know I want to get this y totally by itself. So I'm going to subtract off this 3x. That leaves on this side, remember, sign in front of the sign that goes, that's a negative 2y on this side of negative 3x. The y is still not completely by itself, so I'm going to divide through by a negative 2, and that will give me a y equals, now a negative divided by a negative is a positive, and it gives me 3 halves x. Now the y is by itself. This is in slope-intercept form, and when the y is by itself, it's very easy to identify the slope and the y-intercept. The slope is always going to be the number right in front of the x. Here's where it gets tricky, identifying that y-intercept. But remember, the y-intercept is going to be this number back here that's being added. If I'm adding something, but not really adding something, then that's like adding a zero. Because when you add a zero, you really don't change value at all. So my y-intercept then is going to be zero. Remember, point the 2D coordinate plane, and on that y-axis, because this is a y-intercept, just like we've been saying all along, every point on here has an x-coordinate of zero. But in this case, the y-coordinate will be 0. So basically, my y-intercept here is going to be right at this origin. And then from there, I'm going to use my slope of 3 halves, meaning go up 3, go to the right 2, lands me right here. There's the two points that it takes to make that line. So that's how you take an equation and you rearrange it to get the y by itself to be able to pull out the slope and the y-intercept and be able to use those two to graph it. Then we can also work backwards. Backwards says, well, let's start with this information right here. Let's start with the slope and the y-intercept, and let's be able, let's, let's go back and write the equation of the line coming in the opposite direction. So in each of these examples, we're going to write the equation of the line. given the slope and y-intercept.
then we're going to transform that equation into standard form. Now, since we have to do that transformation into standard form, we need to recall what standard form looks like. Standard form, if you remember, looks like this. AX plus BY equals C. When you're in standard form, you have two criteria that need to be met. Like in the slope intercept, the criteria is that the Y needs to be by itself. That's how you know you're in, in slope intercept form. To know that you're in standard form, what happens is that you have your X and your Y together. As you can see right here, they're together. The constant, the C, A, B, and C are all going to be numbers. Let me back up and write it that way. A, B, and C are, actually they're all going to be integers. Now recall what integers are. Integers means no fractions and no decimals. So this A, this B, this C, they are all going to be numbers, and they are not fractions, they are not decimals. The second criteria is what I started to mention before, and that it is that your X and your Y are together. So notice that X and Y are together on one side of the equal sign, this constant, this number that has no variable with it, it's going to be on the other side of the equation. There's your two criteria to be in standard form. When you've met those two criteria, you're done, you've got standard form. So let's take a look at an example here where let's be, we're given a slope of two-thirds, sorry, negative two-thirds, and we're given a y-intercept of four. And we're told that we need to write the equation of the line and then we need to transform it into that standard form. Well, if you are given a slope and an intercept, mathematicians are not creative at all. So slope and intercept means plug it into your slope and intercept form. That's why we call it like we see it. So, slope-intercept form looks like this, and folks, if you have something that you need to memorize, the easiest way to memorize it is to write it down every single time you use it. You will memorize it without even trying. I never had to make flashcards. I never had to stare at a paper and memorize. I just wrote it down, plugged my numbers in after that. If you write it down that many times, you'll memorize it without even trying. So, this M is now going to become a negative two-thirds, and this B is now going to become a four. So where the direction said write the equation of the line, you did it. You wrote it in slope-intercept form. But notice the directions have a second part. They say let's transform that into standard form. Now if you recall, standard form says let's get rid of all those fractions and decimals. Let's get the x and the y together. It does not matter which part you do first. You can clear out your fractions and then slide your x over here, or you can get your x and y together and then clear out the fractions. It really doesn't matter. Most people will clear out their fractions first. So I'm going to go ahead and go with that. Your fractions right here, remember what's making it a fraction is that denominator of 3. So to clear it out, I'm just going to multiply everything by 3. And that means every single term by 3. So 3 times y is going to be 3y. Three, 3 times negative 2 thirds. Remember how you multiply fractions. The x means multiplication. You're going to create diagonals. You're going to cancel on those diagonals. And then remember, you're going to shoot straight across. So 3 times this negative 2 thirds, these 3's will cancel out because they're on diagonals. And then when I shoot straight across, I'm going to get a negative 2x. And now 3 times a 4 will give me a 12. So I don't have any fractions or decimals. Done. Now I just simply need to get my x and my y together. So I'm going to take this x right here, slide it over, and remember when I go across the equal sign, I'm going to do the opposite to get these to cancel out. And I have a 12 on that side, and on this side I have a positive 2x and a positive 3y because remember the sign in front is the sign that goes. There we go, that's in standard form. So that's how you write the equation of the line. If you're given a slope and an intercept, just plug it into slope intercept form. And then if you need to transform it into standard form, you just make sure that all your fractions and decimals are gone and make sure your x and y are together. All right, let's try one more example of that. This time, let's say that we are given a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of a negative 4. Same directions. I want to write the equation of the line, and then I want to transform it into that standard form. 
So if I'm given a slope and an intercept, again, mathematicians aren't creative, so plug, plop it into that slope-intercept form. So y equals mx plus b. That's going to be a variable. That's going to be a variable. My m is now a 1. And notice here that my b of a negative 4 will go right there. Well, I don't need to show that coefficient of 1 because 1 times anything is just itself. There we go. That's my slope-intercept form. Now remember the direction says let's transform that into standard form. Standard form says let's make sure that there aren't any fractions and decimals. And there aren't. Awesome. Love it when half my work is done. Now all I can do is slide this x over to the other side. So I'm going to subtract an x, subtract an x. Sign in front of the sign that goes. That's a negative x. That's a positive y. And that's a negative 4 on that side. So there we go. There's standard form because I don't have any fractions. I don't have any decimals. The x and the y are together and the constants on the other side. All right, one last example. Because you know things can go a little crazy and things can look a little weird. So in this example, I've got a slope of 0 and a y-intercept of 10. Same directions. I need to write the equation of the line and then I need to transform it into standard form. Well, if I'm given a slope and an intercept, remember, pop that into that slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. In this case, my slope is 0 and my b is a 10. Now, you know that anything times 0 is just a 0. So really, I have just a y equals 0 plus 10, which is really just a y equals 10. So that's going to be my slope-intercept form. And interestingly, as I try to transform this into standard form, well, remember, it says no fractions or decimals. I don't have any fractions or decimals anyway, so I'm good. It also says make sure my x and my y are together. Well, I don't even have an x. So could I say that x and y are together? Yeah, they're already together because I don't have an x. So this is going to be my slope-intercept form and my standard form all in one shot. Pretty cool when that happens. Notice, too, that if I was to go and graph this, um, I have a y-intercept of 10. And I have a slope of 0. Well, a slope of 0, if you remember the skier that we talked about in um, our slope section, the skier, when he was on that horizontal line right here, remember he was sleeping, and so that meant I had a 0 slope. So, if I have zero slope, that means I have a horizontal line looking like this. On this horizontal line, notice that the x values are changing, but that y value is a 10 every single time. So, the way to say, I don't really care what x is, just make sure that that y is a 10, y has to be 10. How do you write y has to be 10? Exactly, right here. y has to be 10. So this is the only equation that would represent that line, y has to be 10. And that's what happens there. All right, so that's what happens with the slope-intercept form of the equation of the line. Like I said before, the big thing to remember is make sure that that y is by itself. When the y is by itself, you can pull out the slope, you can pull out the y-intercept. Your slope is a great counting tool, but you have to have a place to count from. So you need to start with that y-intercept when you graph it, just like we did here, and then utilize that slope as a counting tool to find the rest of the line. All right, have a good day.